Are you looking for a space where you will learn to improve your mental strength, emotional health, and heal your insecurities from the inside out? Take the first step to living a more meaningful life with the Better Me with Body by Brie podcast. I'm your host, Brie. I'm a certified personal trainer, entrepreneur, and mother of three. I've helped empower thousands of women to take action through fitness, nutrition, meditation, personal development, and aligning thoughts with action. This podcast is for those who are ready to feel inspired and motivated to live a more purposeful life. Let's grow together. Have you ever struggled with shame or guilt around your sexuality? Have you ever run into an an embarrassing situation with your child around sex and you just don't know how to respond? In today's episode, I talk with Kristen B. Hobson, a sex therapist and licensed clinical social worker, about how we can create a safe foundation around sexuality for ourselves and our relationships. We also discuss how to talk with our children to help them find confidence in their sexuality. Don't worry, I ask all the embarrassing questions for you so you can just sit back and listen. I learned so much from this episode and I hope you will too. Let's get started. Hi everyone, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited because we have our sex expert, Kristen B. Hodson, on our podcast today. Welcome to the podcast, Kristen. Thanks for having me. I'm super happy to be here. Yes, we are going to get into it today. And before we get into it, I just want to introduce who Kristen is and what she does. So Kristen Hodson is a licensed clinical social worker. She's also a certified sex therapist. She's the founder and executive director of the Healing Group Mental Health Clinic in Salt Lake City, and she's a co-author of the book Real Intimacy, A Couple's Guide for Genuine Healthy Sexuality. She has a unique ability to break down the topics of sexuality into easily digestible pieces, so she's empowering people to develop further in their sexual identity, hone in their sexual values, and improve their communication around sexuality all with the intention to improve people's relationships with themselves and with others. And what I love is that Kristen is very approachable. She's relatable. She has a sense of humor around something that normally feels intimidating or heavy. And she's a mom of three, and she is relatable. She uh, also lives in Salt Lake City, Utah with her husband, Jake. So welcome. Thank, Thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you. I'm really glad. And I I love the opportunity to talk about sex, especially in this format, because I think it makes it so people can tune in a little bit easier. Yes. And I love how approachable everything you post is. She has an amazing Instagram that I will link. And everything she does is just so easy and approachable and to the point, I love that you don't sugarcoat things. So I was really excited when you said that you could be on the podcast because I'm like, you know what? I like being the mouthpiece for the people that are a little too nervous to ask the hard questions because I don't have a filter. Yeah. So I'm like, let's do it. Let's get into it. And today's not necessarily all about sex. It's more about what I wanted to talk with you a little bit about, Kristen, was how your sexuality impacts more than just sex, how having like confidence in your sexuality can help you be more confident in your marriage and maybe talking to your children about sex. So yeah, yeah, let's get into it. I think that's, oh, go ahead. Oh no, you go. I just, when you were saying that, the very first thing that came to mind is oftentimes when people think we're going to talk about sex, they think we're going to talk about what, what, people should be doing like what do you do in sex or like how can we make it spicier or how what are the positions we can be in instead of um being like sexuality is who we are and oftentimes how we feel about our sexuality and the comfort we have within our sexuality extends into other parts of our life for example um how we feel about our bodies our body image is a really important part of our sexuality and Um, the emotions we have around sex, if we feel shame or discomfort or awkwardness or tension, that impacts our sexuality. And it's, I think for a lot of people, they don't, they, there can be a disconnect on sexuality being so much more than what they do. And that when we are born, 
Um, the very first thing babies want to do, they're wired to connect. We want to connect. And our sexuality is our desire to connect. It's a way of how we connect um, with people around us, but it's also a creative energy. It's how we express and show up in the world. And so I think that's a really important place to start. I love that. And I love how you talk about being confident in your sexuality just translates into the rest of your life. So I guess my question would be, Growing up as a strong in a strong Christian household, I wouldn't say there was shame around sexuality, but I have always been a very sexual person, and mm-hmm. I did kind of feel like, is something wrong with me? Like, why am I so sexual? And I had kind of a complex growing up, uh, like in the church with it, because I always felt like, oh, you know, shove it down, shove it down you know, don't, don't talk about it. Don't, don't focus on it. Like it was this constant battle. So I guess, what would you say to people who kind of have that complex where they're trying to find the balance of accepting your sexuality and not feeling shame? Yeah. Well, I think you, well, you hit on something that I think is important that some of the ways that we think about shame would be these overt messages that we heard about sex like maybe negative things or maybe we expressed our sexuality and it was shut down or or things like that and for a lot of people and what the research shows is that the absence of talking about sex also produces shame so you may have not been exposed to a lot of negative messages but you also may have not been exposed to sex positive or informational messages about sex normalizing that you are a sexual being and that's a part of you developing and growing and that your sexuality is important. Additionally, in a lot of Christian homes, sexuality and girls isn't talked about. Most of the time we're hearing about boys being sexual and men being sexual. And so that can create a layer of, am I broken? Is there something wrong with me because I am sexual, but they never talk about me being sexual as a girl or a woman. And so that can create a feeling of shame because you feel like you're different than the quote unquote normal. Um, And so that can be what people, how they can start to develop a thread of shame around their sexuality, because while they may have not received negative messages, they may have not received any information at all. And then they start to wonder if they're normal or broken or weird or something's off, etc. Right. So how would you, how would you maybe work on that to, to have the balance or have the acceptance if like, let's say, you know, one of my mom friends is kind of struggling with like having confidence in her sexuality Mm -hmm. because kind of does feel shame in it. How would, what, what would maybe be some steps to help? One of my favorite one, first of all, one of my favorite books is come as you are by Emily Nagoski. It is a great place to start understanding your sexuality and your body and your desire. But she has a really wonderful metaphor that I think um, answers this question well, which is everyone comes to like they're born and they're kind of given a plot of land. And we're going to say this plot of land are, are the messages we receive. And when we're babies, it's like an open field of land, like it's just dirt. And then as we grow, there's a lot of messages that are planted into our lives. And some of those take deeper root and some are more pervasive and are more like weeds. And once we move into adulthood and we start to realize, I need to start examining my sexuality because I don't feel confident or I feel a lot of shame or there's parts that I feel uncomfortable with. We've got to go back to some of the messages that were planted in kind of our garden and see if they're serving us anymore. Like we may have received, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, Do you have have something in your life that, that maybe you, you have believed for a long time. And then when you examined it, you're like, you know what? I don't know if I believe that anymore. It just was always a part of me. Do you have something like that? Um, yeah, I have a lot. I'm just trying to think of a specific one. Okay. I think honestly, the sexuality thing, like for so long, it was 
it was something that I was like, oh, why am I, you know, why am I so sexual? Because you're right. It was more of a boy thing. So I was like, so, you know, what's going okay. on with me? And then as I got older, I was like, no, that's actually like a really great thing that it helps me be more creative. And I'm kind of seeing the power in it and that it's uh-huh. like a great thing for me and my husband. Yeah. And so I'm seeing it as more of like, oh, no, that's like a strength. That's a fun thing for me. But when okay. I, you know, growing up, I thought it was bad. So, so with that metaphor, that I would say you you examined a message of girls aren't sexual, or they shouldn't be sexual, or they don't want sex, or any variation of that. That may have been a seed or something that was planted in your garden of sexual development, and you may have grown up with that. But then, as you got older, you started to examine that belief and realize maybe that's not true, and Maybe I don't want that in my garden anymore. And it sounds like you've pulled it and then planted something different that you do want, which sex is good for me. It is creative. I love it. And that is honestly the way that we need to start overcoming shame is examining the different messages we have around sex, the different beliefs we've had, and see if they still serve us. And if they were planted by us, like if someone else planted those into our garden and going through and weeding out things that aren't helpful anymore, and then starting to plant the things that we would like. And the challenge of that is at first, we may feel like we're being a fraud. Like we don't really believe the messages we're trying to tell ourselves of, um, I am, I am, my, my body is wonderful just as it is. We can be like, that feels weird and fake, but it just takes time for that new belief to root down because a lot of false beliefs have had a long time to root down and feel more comfortable, even though they're false. Yes. I love that. And I feel like a lot of times they're not really our own beliefs. It's more like what people around us have thought or exactly. you know, what they think or And I know like for a long time, like, so my mom does energy work and she would always say, oh, your sacral chakra is so big. That's like your sexual energy. Your sexual Mm -hmm. energy is so big. Shrink it down. Shrink it down. You know, like for so long. And I know she wasn't meaning anything bad by it, but I was just like, that's who I am. Like, (laughs) right, right. So, and that wasn't necessarily my belief. That was more what some, but like somebody was putting their belief system on. So I love how you're like, let's like re, re look at this and re-examine, is this serving me? And is this what I truly believe? I love yes. that. Yeah. And that's how you, that's how you start to begin to move through shame or discomfort or these other places that can hold us back in our sexuality. Yes. So now kind of shifting because I know a lot of this starts when you are a child and Mm -hmm. the experiences that you have with your parents. Cause for me, my parents were like the first source for me talking about it, explaining about it. And there, we have a really open home, but it wasn't something that we talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. So I really want to touch on how, what's the best way to talk about our children and their sexuality and kind of explain why it's important to them? Yeah. So the, the first thing I see with parents is I think a lot of us were raised um, that if we, if our parents talked to us about sex, they gave us the talk. I think they were raised also in, in that they needed to have a talk with their kids and it was kind of a one and done let's go out and get ice cream and have the talk or, or let's get out a book and have a talk. And usually for some reason, and I think this is common in, in kind of Christian homes, the magical age is eight. Um, yeah. And, and so people have these one talks or maybe they got a talk right before they got married and that's it. And it usually is about reproduction and how babies are made and sexuality and sexual development is so much more than just that it's boundaries it's health and hygiene it is anatomy it's pleasure it's consent it's friendships and relationships and and all of these things that we need to be educating our kids across their whole life on on their developing bodies and the range of emotions they're experiencing and as they're figuring out and navigating 
relationships. And we also want to help our kids navigate the world safely. I don't think a, a parent wants their child to be harmed or sexually exploited. And the more we talk to our kids about sexuality, the more that we protect our kids. Um, yes. So that's important. I love how you were watching Thriller and you paused uh-huh. and were like, okay, we're going to talk about consent here. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're yeah. so good at that. You're so good at just bringing it into everyday lives and just it doesn't have to be this big, long, drawn out talk. It's just like little things each day, maybe a little quick five minute example. You make it so approachable. I love that. And that's, I think that's an, another important piece, and I'm glad you brought that up, is a lot of parents will wait for their kids to approach them. Um, I've heard a lot of parents say, you know, I just don't think it's on their minds because they've not said anything to me, or they're too young to be curious about this, or they're too young to know about X, Y, or Z. And before they know it, their kids are 12 or 13, and they're still waiting for them to come have a a talk and when we understand what's developmentally normal it's our role and opportunity as parents to lead these one minute conversations um, as well as be prepared to respond to the everyday situations and the questions so it's not just waiting for our kids to ask us questions we need um, ideally to be approaching them with what we want to teach them and that there's a statistic I really want to give because I think it is it makes a case for why we need to be having these conversations frequently. Um, and I'll ask you how many this is now this is like back of the napkin math, but how many hours do you think kids spend learning how to read from kindergarten to twelfth grade? Oh, I have no idea. I would say like days. They have, it's approximately 2,500 hours Wow! and same with math. It's a lot of time. And when we, because our goal, we want our kids to be literate. We hope that when our kids graduate high school, they are literate. They can read, they can write and same with math because those are skills that help them function in the world. And these skills develop over a lifetime. Like they're starting off with recognizing letters and then putting together small words and then sentences, right? Like yeah. it becomes developed over time. Um, do you know how many hours kids get of sexual health information, like formal sexual health information between kindergarten and 12th grade? And not all states have access to this information. I would say like one or two hours. Okay, it's it's a little higher, but it's 17.2, which might seem high, but that's only one hour a year-ish wow. total. And But then yet we hope our kids will be sexually literate and prepared and to navigate um, sexual situations and relationships. And we're really not preparing them or equipping them with the skills to expect that they could be literate, um, as they grow up. So what would you when do you start talking to about it with your kids? I, they have all like my goal as a parent was that when my kids, and I don't know why this became my goal, but it really was of when my kids were sitting in a room and they were at like with friends, maybe when they got older and they were like, how old were you when you got the, the talk in air quotes? that they would kind of look at their friends with a confused look and be like, what do you mean about the talk? Because they always had conversation about sex in the home, always. Like they never had a talk. It just was part of our everyday. And so um, we have, I have been teaching my kids about sexual health since the moment they were born. And one of the ways I did that is like when I would change their diapers I would name their body parts. And even though they couldn't understand it, it helped me increase my comfort and develop the language. And you have a really captive audience, like babies just smile. And when you say vulva or penis in really high tones with a big smile, they just smile back at you being like, you're a rock star. So it started there. And when kids are sharing their toys, great opportunity for consent and body boundaries, and when they have big emotions, to be able to name those emotions, which is part of sexual health. So it, it really is, I mean, the joke with my 
friends is that I start talking to my kids about sex when they're in utero. So, because really when you understand that it's so much more than teaching your kids about reproduction, you realize, oh yeah, I can be starting. There is no age to begin. You can begin whatever age, wherever your kids are at right now, you can start. So do you have a course or something that teaches parents how to talk about this? I know your Instagram is so helpful. Yeah, I do actually. I have a course called Foundations. And what it does is is it really provides parents with the principles. They learn what they need to be teaching at each age and stage. They understand what is developmentally normal because Kids will get to these different ages and parents will be like, is this normal? And then they realize that's normal. Okay, we're on track here. And if there's things that are out of the range of normal, what having resources and support on maybe what you would need to do or how to handle that. Um, it provides skills on how to start these conversations and skills on how to respond to big situations or questions and everyday situations. So the foundations course really does start to help parents uh, see themselves as the sex educator in their home. I love that. And that's so helpful because not all adults are, are healthy with their sexual, you know, relationship with themselves. And uh-huh. so maybe that can even help them. Cause I'm thinking of, you know, adults who have been sexually abused, they might have a skewed, a skewed vision of what is healthy and what's not. So that might be a great tool to help them know. You know what? It it really does. I find in my classes, because most of us, if you go back to that 17.2 hour statistic, that's the max amount of education most of us got. And so there's no reason why any of us should know as adults Um, all about our sexuality we kind of probably learned it on the fly through our own lived experiences from the media from friends like we picked up the information but it wasn't in any formal way and some information we didn't get and some's inaccurate Um, so what I have seen in the foundations course they're like let's say I have I have in one portion of the course a whole list of sexual health terms and it is really normal and common that I've had parents reach out and say, okay, I'm supposed to teach these words to the kids, but I don't even know what they mean. Can you, right. can you tell me what this word is? And I love that because now they're giving themselves permission to grow in their own knowledge and understanding and their education by wanting to be able to teach their children. I love that. I love that so much. I feel like when it's just talked about and it's so open, like you said, the shame goes away. It's a normal part of life. It's a healthy part of life. Yeah. Okay, so I have a couple specific questions for you now because I know I was talking to some of my friends and family, and I'm like, okay, I'm doing this interview. What questions do you have? How would you, you know, approach certain situations? So I have specific questions. I want to see how you would answer them, okay? Okay, sounds good. So this might sound kind of random, but this is the phase of life that I'm in right now. So I have a six-year-old daughter. And I always want her to feel empowered and comfortable expressing herself. And like I said, I'm kind of an open book, so I don't really get uncomfortable talking about things because I never want her to feel shame about her body or anything. But I remember that we were watching a show with my sister and her daughter's also six. And like on the show, the boy and the girl were kissing, you know, just for a second. But I remember she was like, oh, my gosh, cover your eyes. Don't look at that. I don't want you to see that. Like, you know, and I was thinking, I feel like if we make it a big deal and we make her feel bad for looking or maybe maybe even liking it, then maybe that will give her a complex because I feel like it's normal and natural to like that. We're, we are born to like it. So how do we foster a sense of independence with our sexuality while also helping to guide them from a moral stance? So let me let me just make sure I'm clear. Is it was it um, your daughter that said don't don't look, close your eyes? Oh, sorry, my sister to her daughter. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so she was like saying, like she was going, Addie, don't watch that. Why are you looking at that? You know, like uh-huh. she didn't mean to make her feel bad. You know, I think, but 
But I'm just saying like, and I'm, I'm looking at my daughter thinking like, well, how do I, I never want her to feel bad for liking that because that is what we're made to do. Right. But, but how do I, you know, kind of have like a moral, a moral guideline and while also helping them feel a sense of independence with their sexuality? Yeah, I think the word I would also use is values. Values, and yes. Because values and morals can go hand in hand. Um, but usually, like, morals can influence values. Values um, can also stand on their own. And the word that I would also introduce would be curiosity. That at age six, um, there may not be a response of liking it. It just may be curious of, like... That's true. Like, it just could be a a curiosity thing. And as adults, we can at times project our adult understanding of sexuality onto these kids that developmentally, they're in a constant state of curiosity and wonder and asking questions and trying to make sense of the world around them. And most likely in that situation, um, there, one, it, it doesn't have to even be scooped out and made a thing about it. It may have just been a very normal situation. Two, if there were to be a teaching moment, it would, I would, having it be from a place of values and intention, um, because media can be a powerful tool for teaching our kids. But when we as parents know what our values are around sexual health, then that becomes how we teach and guide our kids. Instead of what I like to think values do is they help us begin with the end in mind. And now we're intentionally guiding our children instead of moving from incident to incident, trying to figure out how to handle each thing. We're, we have a bigger, a bigger plan in mind, which allows us to tolerate the moments that are just kind of like not a big deal moments and other moments that we need to scoop up and have more conversations and teaching around. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And when I will say this, when parents, kids, so have you ever had the experience when you tell, like, how many times have you told your kids to not look at something and they want to look at it even more? Yeah. Or you say, don't follow me. And then they're like following you because that's the stage they're in. Um, I I still do that. If I tell myself I can't have sugar, all I want is sugar. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And so while there may be really good intentions, when parents like, turn something off and they don't say anything like it's perfectly okay if you are in like movies from the 80s still I I'm like oh I didn't even remember this had that part in there and it's perfectly okay to turn it off but just to shut it down can send a message we don't mean rather than so a values-based discussion might be like hey, I'm going to, I didn't realize this part of the movie was in there. Let's talk about what this is and why I'm going to fast forward it right now. Or you don't even have to fast forward it. It might be like, here's what's happening. Or are you curious? Or like my friend had a story where, do you remember the show The Sandlot? Yes. And do you remember the lifeguard? And I'm blanking on her name. Yes. With the white glasses. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. So you have the lifeguard and you have squints. And my friend said that his son was watching it and they have a, they raised their kids in a very similar way um, that I have. And that I, yeah, it's just very, they're my best friends. Anyway, he said to his dad, like the scene came on where she's or squints falls in the pool and she rescues him and then he kisses her. And the nine-year-old boy was like, dad, my penis is doing something really weird. And the dad was like, oh yeah, so your penis is having an erection. And that's what penises do. Isn't that cool? Like, that's amazing. He's like, yeah, that's a new feeling for me. And like, but that was it. They didn't go into a longer conversation. And he more or less was like, yep, your penis will get hard and then it will get soft again. And like, just normalizing it and normalizing that moment and responding to that child in a way that like that's a a positive reflection back and going back to shame when we don't reconcile our own shame or our own discomfort moments like that 
we can freeze up or not know how to respond because they, they ping our own discomfort. Yeah. And so then we are not responding intentionally. We're just kind of passing on our own stuff instead of guiding them. Definitely. That is so helpful. And I love how he, I love how he, his son felt comfortable coming to him saying that. Yeah. Well, he didn't know that he shouldn't. Right. I mean, that's true. He, he had no idea that 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 kind of conversation would be weird or off limits or, and even he didn't even see it as the boy didn't even see it as sexual. It just was like, yeah. my penis is doing something new. And yeah. of course, like um, our kids are, still forming and learning about their like forming a relationship with their body but to him that is no different than saying like look at look at my eye is twitching or right. look at how I can contort my body into this shape or whatever right exactly mm-hmm. so that leads me to my next question so I know you've talked about this and you had the best analogy with kids picking their nose oh and- yes with kids like stimulating themselves or if a parent like sees them curious about their private areas, like what do you, you had such a good analogy. Can you share that? Yeah. So most parents know and expect that their kids are going to pick their nose like early. Right. I mean, kids discover the nose holes at like five months. Once they can kind of kind of connect and coordinate their hands to the rest of their body, usually they find their nose holes. And parents right then aren't like getting their hands out of their nose. And we, we, while we may not love it, once they get older and they start picking their nose and then they're eating their boogers, we just, we anticipate that. We know it's developing, developmentally normal. And then we start socializing around it where we start introducing hey, if you pick your nose too much, you're going to get scabs or please blow your nose or go into the bathroom to pick your nose and wash your hands and eating your burgers might not be a great idea. Like we we really socialize it. Um, but kids ultimately form a really intimate relationship with picking a nose. Like they usually develop, and all of us, like a finger we like to pick with and the reason why I bring this up is people are like, ew, that's really gross that you're talking about that. But it's everybody picks their nose. Everybody knows that that's going to be a thing. Right. And we approach it as parents in a, in a proactive manner for the most part. When it comes to masturbation, we can have an idea that it's not developmentally normal, that it is under the realm of morality instead of sexual health and normal sexual development. You can have it be in the realm of normal sexual development and teach the morals around it and socialize around it. But when we shut it down, like imagine if our child was picking their nose and we never, ever let them touch their nose. We never, they, we just continued to shut that down. And then we hoped when they got married, they would have a good relationship with that. Um, But then even when they're married and they're, I know this analogy is super weird, but it, for some reason it opens up doors for people to think about it or talk about it. Um, they still are not allowed to pick their nose or they feel shame about picking their nose, but their partner can pick their nose or they need to tell their partner how to pick their nose. And they're like, I have zero idea on how to do that. And so masturbation is a normal part for people to for kids to learn how their body works and functions. There are, um, th- there's ultrasounds of babies s- stroking their general genitals in utero for comfort. And it's not in the same way that adult, like the biggest thing is adults really can project their sexuality onto kids. And it's, it's not the same, um, for kids, they just know that it feels good, like pleasure and other parts of their body touching like that feels good. And it's a unique kind of pleasure and it can bring comfort and we can socialize around it as they, we can continue to guide and shape so they, they don't feel shame. For some parents, they it, masturbation feels in line with their values and for others, masturbation isn't in line with their values and you can work with both. But just shutting it down 
is not effective and usually leads to outcomes that parents ultimately don't want for their children. But you can guide children with values if those if that is what you value, but just to shut it down or to expect it to not happen um, isn't necessarily realistic or the healthiest approach. Right. And I feel like it's so sad because they don't really fully understand. So it, it would be sad to like bring shame to it and be like, make them feel bad about themselves, you know, and they don't really know what's even going on. Like no. it's the saddest thing. So I always... I always felt so bad and I never want like my daughter or my son to ever feel shame around that either because I'm like, you know what, that is a natural part of growing up, like you said, and being curious. And um, anyway, I just, I always want that to be an open conversation and to be very understanding about it. And I feel like that's a really big topic in Christian, in the Christian world and (laughs) I feel like there there were a lot of poor little kids who felt like, you know, they weren't loved by God if if they yeah. masturbated. Like that was the sad, that's just the saddest thing to me. So I would never ever want my child to feel like that, but that's also my own personal belief system. But I love that you're just like if we keep it an open conversation, then we can talk about the values around it. And that that's just it is um to the parents where they're like, oh, masturbation doesn't fit into my value system. I think where people can get stuck is in this all or nothing idea. Like it's either a free for all and I, I let my kids masturbate all the time or I shut it down. And really the kids need information and guidance around wherever your values are. Um, going back to the picking the nose analogy, there's a lot of guidance and conversation and redirection. And if the ultimate goal is for kids to save their sexuality for marriage, um, then they're, they're also ideally as a tolerance for them to start to develop and get to the point where they have a healthy relationship with their sexuality and they are choosing to save their sexuality for marriage yeah. rather than feeling like this is something I have to do or I'm bad. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I also love just how open you are about all of it. It's so great. So I have one more question for you. Okay. Um, So do you talk, ever talk about pornography? And like, if you find your children looking at pornography, like what are ways to talk to them about it so that maybe it's an open dialogue? Yeah, I absolutely, that's, in fact, that's uh, another course that I have, which is called Exposed. Oh, and that's it's to awesome. help. Yeah, and it comes, all of these courses come with workbooks and reflection questions and exercises and activities. And um, But this one is really important because a lot of parents, they can want to start, they can feel more comfortable having conversations about the scary stuff because we want to protect our kids. And so sometimes they'll have conversations about abuse or pornography um, before they're having these conversations just about sexuality and sexual health in general. But the, the main thing with pornography is to help our kids start to develop some literacy around media and to develop a definition around what is pornography? What is pornography in our home? What um, is simple as that is, uh, you can have, it, it can, it's a really good exercise for families and or even couples to be like, what? what is pornography? Because I will do an exercise on Instagram and I will ask questions of like, okay, is the da- a naked man in the museum like a David, is that pornography? And people will answer yes or no. Is the swimsuit edition of Sports Illustrated pornography? Yes or no. What about cartoons engaged in a sexual act? Like I go through so many different things and it gets parents thinking of like, oh, what is it and how, so that we can start guiding our kids and what do I do if I've caught my kids, which in a very quick nutshell, um, oftentimes the, the reasons why kids are turning to pornography, and this is from the work of Braxton Dutson, is they're either clicking, curious, or coping. Clicking is they're just kind of moving through the internet and they've misspelled a word like they were wanting to search for tights and they spelled tights, T-I-T-S. And they 
they land on something they didn't mean to. Um, and so they're just clicking through. Curious is they heard a word at school and they want to hear what it means and they land on pornography. Um, or they're just curious about bodies and they just are curious and they don't have any other outlets. And coping could be for those kiddos that they're coping with stress or anxiety or other emotional issues in their life. But those are usually the reasons and um, parents can respond in a way that supports their children and, and furthers their relationship or again kind of shuts them down and stifles the opportunity to explore what it is about pornography that they're curious about. I love that. I love how open you are about it because I feel like every child will see it. Isn't the statistic that every child will see it by the 10 or 12? Yeah. And even younger. And, you know, you think about, I know that when my boy was in fourth grade, he had friends that had unlimited access to the latest iPhones at school. And so, um, and it, and it also it just depends on how we're defining it. It's sexual imagery is all around us. Sexual imagery is embedded in music and the lyrics they're listening to. And so helping them navigate um, sexually explicit media is a really important part. And one of the reasons I have, I like people to take the foundations course first because um, we want pornography to be part of the conversation, but not to be the conversation. Yes. Um, we don't necessarily want to lead out with pornography, but to, to bring it into the, all the other conversations that we're having. Yes. I love that. And having that foundation. I'm really excited. I'm going to take both of those courses because I want to be prepared. I mean, my kids are still pretty young, but I, I can still start with the foundation, like you said, and it just gives me so much hope that we'll be one of those families. Like I want my daughter to come to me and ask me the question and feel comfortable, you know, and know that I'm an open book or I'm not going to judge her on her question or her curiosity and have that open communication with our family. So I'm really excited about your courses. And I'm so glad. And I would, um, I love hearing that you want to be the go-to person for your children. I think that's such a fantastic and very realistic goal. Yeah. And then I feel like if we do have values that we want to teach, there's this really great relationship behind it. And it's not like, this is what we do because, you know, it's about heaven or hell. It's not about that. It's about them making decisions for themselves and what they feel is right for them. Exactly. And, yeah. And it's just like you, you said with our sexuality, when we get older, that's what we have to do. So that's right. Like you're really supporting them and helping develop their own internal compass that they will need because they're going to find they're going to be engaged in so many different situations throughout their whole life. If they have an internal compass, then they have a better chance of navigating those. Yes. When we're not there, you know, like we won't be with them all the time. So okay. that's when they're on their own and, and we're not around, that's when they'll have to make the decisions for themselves. And we have to trust that we've helped equip them. So yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm just so grateful. You are so wise. Thank you. Oh, so thank you for being here and helping my listeners and my followers. And I know that this is going to be so helpful for, I already know, like all of my friends listening to this are going to, they've had a lot of questions already answered. So I'm really good. Grateful. Thank you so much. And I will link all of her, um, her Instagram, her website, and I will also link her programs if you guys are interested and you want to check them out as well. I will link everything in the show notes. So one other thing is when you get the foundations course, you can also add on um, office hours. And so that way, as you move through the material and you have questions, you have not only access to me, but to other parents and oh, hearing yeah. their questions and getting to see those questions get answered too. And you get into this private Facebook group and all of the questions and answers get saved in there so that you can have that. Oh, that's amazing. What a cool resource. Yeah. So I just, I wanted to let people know because inevitably and naturally people have questions as they move through the material. And so there's a space for that as well. Awesome. You thought of everything. 
You're doing so much good in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And if you guys don't follow her, you have to because every time it's just such a great truth bomb. And I just love that you're you're this like warrior of truth and you're so wise and you're relatable and you're fun and you're spunky and I I just love you. So thank you thank for everything you. you brought to this world. You are just way nice. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Kristen, I will talk to you later. Have a good day. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us in today's episode. If you liked the content and want to hear more, remember to hit that subscribe button and write a review. As a small business owner, I appreciate it more than you know. If you are looking for a program to help with self-confidence, to lose weight, get in shape, and work on your mental, physical, and emotional health, check out my training programs on www.bodybybree.com. My team and I help to hold you accountable through the Body by Brie app, where you log in to see all your workouts, custom meal plan made specifically for you and your needs and communication through the messenger. You are never alone when you're on the Body by Breed training program. Click the link in the show notes to get more information on how to transform your life from the inside out.